Okay, welcome. Uh, this is chapter six, where we're going to start taking a look at children with intellectual disabilities. Children with intellectual disabilities uh, run the gamut. Uh, they're probably the most closely identified to SPED uh, uh, individuals in special education. Um, they um, rage in um, all sorts of intensities from being uh, fairly independent to, um, uh, to requiring quite a bit of assistance. Uh, these are individuals that have a cognitive processing, whereas when we looked at learning disabilities, they had, there, there were some information processing deficits, but it wasn't a capacity issue. With regards to intellectual disability, there is some capacity issue with regards to uh, being able to perform certain tasks. Uh, it's not a question of how information is received. Sometimes it's just the inability sometimes to be able to process that. That concept of mild intellectual disabilities needs to be considered carefully. When the, it's younger, we're a bit hesitant to um, place the label ID. Um, ID replaced mental retardation because of the derogatory connotations associated with mental retardation. And so we've changed that recently to intellectual disabilities. Um, but even that label itself is somewhat stigmatizing and uh, quite frankly terrifying for parents, especially of parents of newborns. Uh, where we're looking at this mild mental uh, intellectual disability. Um, and so a lot of times the term is going to be used developmentally delayed. You will see that a lot. It's a catch-all phrase. Uh, and it's softer, um, and so there's a, a bit less um, concerns or stigma associated with uh, applying that label. But that also comes with a cost, is that it's also less specific in the diagnosis, and, and so therefore the treatments may, may be a bit less intensive than if we uh, accurately uh, identified the child as intellectual disability. Um, but you will see the prevalence of the preponderance of kids who are, especially in kindergarten and first grade, will receive the label developmentally delayed um, if those... Um, if that is not rectified through instruction, then a lot of times in uh, the older grades, they do receive the label intellectual disability. It is a term, it is a term that we use to describe the that, uh, an individual who has functioned significantly below in what is considered I, uh, average IQ. Uh, average IQ, if you look at it in the two broad scheme of assessments, you have IQ and you have achievement. Um, achievement is what you've learned. IQ tests are what your potential is for learning. Um, the mean IQ or the average IQ is right there at 100. Um, and when we go in and take a look at individuals um, who uh, are significantly below, that's up to the individual divisions, but it's usually two standard deviations below the mean. So if we have an average IQ of 100 and the standard deviation is 15, then one standard deviation below the mean is going to be an IQ of 85, two is 70. And 70-ish is about where we start saying we're a little concerned that this child has an intellectual disability. So if someone receives an IQ, uh, is engaged in an IQ test, and they receive a, a standard score of 70 or below, um, uh, that is one of the criteria that we use for identifying students who are intellectually disabled. But it's just one of two. You cannot use IQ solely um, on its own as the determining factor if the child is going to receive the label ID. It's a pretty generic term, and it is a real diverse group. Um, mental retardation is still used in some federal documents. Um, many people believe that it is stigmatizing and offensive. Uh, the term mental retardation is not stigmatizing, but the way that it has been used in popular culture and slang language has made it somewhat derogatory and um, disrespectful to the importance of individuals who um, uh, who are intellectually disabled, and more importantly, or maybe not more importantly, but as important to the parents and loved ones or siblings of, 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 of individuals who have an intellectual disability. So we use that as a
positive term for right now, but as these terms, mental retardation was a term that replaced dumb, idiot, ignorant, you know, um, moron, uh, these real derogatory terms that were at one time, one time medical um, and mental retardation replaced those terms because of the stig stigmatizing uh, um, effects of, of those terms. And so mental retardation now is being replaced with intellectual disabilities. Um, we can replace these terms as much as we want until we um, start as a society to value each individual with it what they bring to the table as opposed to um, replacing words uh, maybe we can replace those concepts um, or those dispositions that individuals have but for now we're replacing the words and right now it's intellectual disability um, intellectual disability is commonly characterized by two dimensions one is that limited intellectual ability significantly below average significant is defined as two standard deviations below the mean Again, we go back to that 70 IQ. An average mean IQ is 100. Standard deviation is 15 on these assessments. One standard deviation is 85. Two standard deviations is 70. So significantly below average is at 70, and that's a capacity issue. Their ability to, to bring in information, encode it properly, and then be able to retrieve it is much more challenging for someone who has a lower IQ. But in addition to that, IQ, again, is, is not enough. They have difficulty in coping with social demands of the environment. These adaptive skills or functioning skills are at a deficit. So they have to have a combination of adaptive and functioning skill deficits and a low IQ um, during that developmental period. And that developmental period is usually birth to 18. Um, intellectual function, this is part of the definition uh, it's, it's intended to be a broad summary of cognitive abilities, the one's capacity to learn, one's ability to solve problems, think abstractly, all those critical thinking skills um, are severely impacted by your cognitive ability uh, it, or enhanced by your cognitive ability. Um, a cognitive ability, again, is measured um, right now, probably some would debate, but our probably most established way of doing that is just the typical IQ test. Um, operationally, it has been reduced to the performance of an intelligence test, and I get it, we don't like tests, but it's fairly accurate uh, in the sense of that those individuals who have low IQs tend to struggle more with content than those with high IQ. So we're really looking at that IQ quotient of between 70 and 75 as being one of those factors. But again, IQ, again, I want to reiterate, IQ is not in and itself enough to receive the label ID. You have, you have to have those deficits in adaptive behavior. And that's where the standards of maturity, learning, personal independence, social responsibilities uh, that are expected for a child at their particular age and level and in their particular culture group. Um, this is being able to engage in conversations, personal hygiene, being able to um, uh, um, responsibility. There, there's a variety of things with the adaptive skills that we're looking, but they must have deficits with IQ and adaptive. Um, that's why we see probably about 3% of the population um, having an IQ right at that 70 to 75 or lower, uh, but only 1% of the population is identified as ID um, because the other 2% that meet the IQ um, criteria do not have issues in adaptive skills, so they are therefore not uh, intellectually disabled. The development period, again, as I said, is between um, conception and 18 years of age. Uh, below average intellectual function and impairment and adaptive behavior must appear during that time um, and not a byproduct of uh, blood uh, head trauma like uh, traumatic brain injury, something we would associate maybe in a car crash or some other um, uh, critical accident. Um, it just needs to manifest itself um, without any other attributable causes. There are five assumptions that are essential um, to, you know, in, in your book here that are essential to the application of the definition. Um, one is that limit uh, limitations in present functioning must be considered within the context of the community environments typical of the individual's pay, age and peers and culture. So basically, 
How's he doing? How's she doing compared to everyone else that is in their environment? Or is there a significant lower ability that is noticeable, measurable? Um, and so not something, I'm not going to take a kid who's in region A and compare him to region B. I'm going to compare, uh, compare that kid in region A to uh, the child in a similar uh, situation in region A. Valid assist assessments considered culturally and linguistically diverse, as well as differences in communication, sensory, motor, and behavior factors must be um, uh, uh, taken into consideration. Um, uh, within an individual, limitations often coexist with strengths. That's a huge assumption. This is not just a deficit model where we, we list off these things that this child cannot do. Uh, an important purpose of describing limitations is to develop a uh, an idea of where do we need to go with this guy? You know, where do we need, where do we, where does her education need to begin? So limitations aren't just a, a laundry list of things that you can't do. Um, it is uh, 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 potential goals uh, that can be um, identified in the special education classroom and uh, pursued. With one assumption is also with appropriate personalized support with that individualized education plan. Um, we can see that it's sustained over time. We can see that that student's life outcomes are going to improve dramatically. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, but it's important that we take a look at um, what are those particular needs that a child has. Uh, prevalence, historically, the most common placement was a self-contained classroom. Uh, but now we're seeing more and more children um, being included who have IDs. Uh, this causes, on the one hand, uh, many elementary ed uh, teachers are, are, are very excited about that, um, but they also have some reservations of how what's expected of them um, and what exactly, how is that going to change their classroom and what exactly do they need to do and do they have the skills necessary. Um, and that's where special education can work very closely. Uh, with general education, they should, uh, but it still has a great deal of concern. Um, now, um, the placement of students in programs outside the general education uh, is also still pretty, um, pretty prevalent. So we see individuals who are placed in special schools and those kinds of things. Um, but for us, uh, we are going to see a great deal um, of the kids who are uh, identified as ID in that inclusive classroom. Okay, so much for part one. Uh, please view part two prior to, doing, um, prior to going to the kind of uh, example video and definitely prior to going into the questions. All right, take care.